Hi guys and welcome to a special Seahawks flashback commentary and uh, news notes from the 1983 season. This audio commentary is meant to be viewed in conjunction or heard rather in conjunction with an article I have written and posted at fieldgoals.com. So if you're seeing this on YouTube and you don't know what it's about, this the companion article that this goes with will be posted down in the links in the uh, in the description box below. So you can follow that and you can read up on what I'm setting up through this audio commentary. So there's a lot to talk about here. Um, entering the 1983 season, Seattle uh, needed to right the ship after uh, really just failing to capitalize on the 78 and 79, 9 and 7 finishes that uh, had propelled them almost to the playoffs. However, being in the toughest division in football at the time, the AFC West, they were on the outside looking in despite some really spectacular offensive numbers. Their biggest problem was their offensive numbers meant that they had to keep up with a defense that liked to give up lots of points, typically winning victories by, you know, fewer than, than four points. Uh, several of their victories in 79 coming as two points or less. So, entering 1983, the Seahawks are going to make several changes. Uh, they brought in Mike McCormick in 1982. He would then fire Jack Patera two games in to the 82 strike-shortened season. There were only nine games played. And Jack Patera really had lost the team by that point. Uh, the team was not particularly pleased with him. Uh, several of the games in 1980 uh, had um, a lot of a lot of bad losses late. Um, uh, three consecutive losses in 1980, all three at home were by a total of nine points. And so the team really had had lost uh, whatever energy they had for playing for Jack Patera. In fact, the great quote uh, uh, that kind of set him out the door soon afterward was when Efren Herrera, the kicker at the time for Seattle, had come out and uh, said that he questioned the toughness of the team. He questioned whether the team was really in, in the grind, uh, be able to be mentally tough. And the coach, Jack Patera, responded, quote, I think Efren's gotten into a bad case of enchiladas. Which, you know, you know, then that was probably okay. You could get away with that. Today, you say something like that, it's splashed all over ESPN, and there's questions about racial sensitivity. But really... The quote itself was an example of just the coach starting to lose the locker room. And of course, by 1982, they had made uh, the decision to move on. But Mike McCormick had, in fact, uh, gone 4-3 and three as a head coach in the final four games as he took over the job uh, from Jack Patera. He's hired on as team president and general manager, so he has all of these roles. So Mike Holmgren was not the first one to wear every hat in the organization for Seattle. Mike McCormick did that in 1982. Um, the organization wanted Mike McCormick to hold the job, in fact. Uh, several sources within the organization felt like he was their guy. He had brought you know, the team back from the brink. They seemed to achieve more. Uh, Jim Zorn had a nice, uh, a pretty good finish to the season and looked okay. Uh, but in the end, um, 
Uh, Mike McCormick said no. He went out and got Chuck Knox, who was kind of floundering in Buffalo. Um, they made the playoffs two of his uh, six years there, and he made the playoffs all five years he was in L.A. previous. So he had 11 years under his belt of coaching before coming to Seattle, and he had a pretty good track record. Uh, he brings in his own coordinators, Ray Prochaska, for offense. And for defense, Tom Catlin. Uh, Ray Prochaska would move on in a couple of years, but Tom Catlin would be a staple for Chuck Knox and his defensive approach to football. Uh, Chuck Knox comes in and gives instant credibility to the franchise, who had... Uh, uh, even though Jack Patera had won Coach of the Year in 78 and 79 for really getting his teams to overachieve against a defense that was ranked the league worst, uh, Chuck Knox had a track record of a lot of winning wherever he'd been. Uh, solidly run organizations, a good approach that's easy to look at and, and maximize. You know, he comes in and instantly begins to overhaul the offense and build his team. Uh, he's a run-first coach. His offense is referred to uh, sort of sarcastically as ground chuck. It's not lovingly as some highlight reels would lead you to believe. A lot of people wanted to see that wide open they had fallen in love with the Zorn wide open passing offense of days past, you know, and Zorn at that time uh, when he was king in Seattle and people really loved him, uh, was passing the ball well beyond what most quarterbacks were doing at the time. You would see a lot of quarterbacks, if anybody approached 400 throws, uh, you considered them throwing quite a bit. Um, Seattle attempted 27 passes per game, which led the league twice, I believe. Uh, and in fact, Jim Zorn would lead the league in passing attempts uh, with over 464 in, I believe it was... Let's let's check. I'm going to be absolutely certain before I say something stupid. And I'm sorry, no. Uh, Jim Zorn led the league just once in attempts with 439 in 1976. But he, in fact, was one of the league leaders for several years. In fact, topping out at 505 passes in 1979, he had a pretty good completion percentage with ne nearly 57% uh, of his passes. And at that time, you have to remember that passing wasn't a refined art. So a lot of guys, if you go back to the old quarterbacks at the time, they weren't throwing a lot. So... Uh, you know, you'd see guys with 325 passing attempts and, you know, 20 touchdowns and 23 interceptions, something like that. So Jim Zorn was really kind of, uh, you know, hyper-efficient when you compare him against some of his contemporary counterparts. Um, the reason I'm kind of talking about this a little bit is because uh, there's a switch at quarterback uh, halfway through the 83 season. So that's a big note. But one of the one of the first things Chuck Knox does, of course, is rebuild the offense. So going into that, he brings in a couple of veterans from the free agency scrap heap uh, from his uh, old teams. He brings in Colin Bryant, fullback for, from the L.A. Rams, he brings in Charlie Young, who played for him with the L.A. Rams. And then he trades with Buffalo to bring in 12-year veteran Reggie McKenzie. And then he goes out 
and picks up Zach Dixon from uh, who was cut from the Colts to be his kick returner. So uh, he's already making moves to kind of cement, um, you know, the offensive special teams. And then he comes along and and says in the draft, okay, I want to go get a franchise running back. And this leads them to Penn State runner Kurt Warner at the number three spot. They trade up to get him. I was not able to find who with, but I do know that there's only one other notable player from that draft, and that's Sam Merriman, uh, the linebacker out of uh, Boise State, I believe. And so there wasn't really a lot coming out of the draft, but there was already a complete upheaval of the franchise in terms of the approach, which had been, again, this wide open passing, throw it all over the field, you know, that had, you know, built Steve Largent into a perennial Hall of Famer. Uh, already, by that stage of his career, he was well known as, as the ideal receiver, leading the conference several times in receptions, yardage, touchdowns, you name it. Steve Largent was the leader in it, at least three times in the conference or even the league at the time. So, so, uh, so it was kind of a culture shock for Seattle fans to go from the, the wide open, hyper creative Jack Patera to now a uh, conservative run the ball, play good defense, Chuck Knox. Uh, Chuck Knox also, speaking of the defense, went from Seattle's uh, fundamental 4-3 defense. He and Tom Catlin remade it into a 3-4 defense. So using most of the same players. So they didn't go out and get a bunch of new guys to fill positions. They didn't go uh, get, you know, too many guys. They did sign a USFL player in Kerry Justin to play the nickel position because Seattle really didn't have a guy to play that spot. And uh, then Kerry Justin would also step in for Keith Simpson on more passing downs. But, so Chuck Knox recreates everything. He sort of rebuilds the entire organization. And... Uh, unfortunately, eight games into the season, they went ahead and went with Jim Zorn. But after Jim kind of floundered a little bit, had trouble consistently commanding the offense and doing things sort of his own way and, and living on this sort of freelance, freewheeling backyard football with his scrambling ability... Chuck Knox said, okay, enough's enough. They pulled the trigger on Dave Craig. And what I have to say on that is Dave Craig had been given another opportunity to succeed. Dave Craig was drafted in 1980 out of Milton College. He is the only player to be drafted out of there, and that college no longer exists. So that kind of tells you how small it is, it was. And uh, so Dave Craig comes in. Uh, I'm sorry, he was drafted in 1981, excuse me. Let me correct that. Uh, he was drafted in 1981, and he played the final two games of the season, throwing seven touchdowns and five interceptions in just those two games. Now... The the fact, first of all, that he did not start those games. He came up in mop-up roles. He came out in mop-up roles and actually led huge comebacks. Um, what stands out to me in terms of the stats aren't the interceptions, like some people would, but in terms of the prolificness of the quarterback position, you just didn't see 
just all these touchdowns scored in such a, a fashion. So the seven touchdowns really stand out. And I believe that um, Jim Zorn either was hurt, uh, something with the strike kept him out, but Seattle actually runs with Dave Craig as a starter the next season. And Dave Craig kind of flounders in two games, throwing two interceptions, uh, no touchdowns, and just 153 yards in two games. So it doesn't, doesn't look too good. They go back to Jim Zorn. Uh, so Dave Craig looks like he's already lost his chance to be a starting quarterback uh, just his second year in. Uh, Jim Zorn, you know, goes 4-4 four and four as a starter in 1983. Throws seven touchdowns and seven interceptions. But really the fluidity of the offense isn't there. And the ability uh, to run some of the deeper pass patterns that Chuck Knox likes to run off play action. Uh, just the ability for Zorn isn't there. The arm isn't there. It isn't where it needs to be. Uh, Chuck Knox makes the switch. And... That doesn't cure anything uh, in terms of their record. They wind up uh, winning two and losing two. And coming into this game in which I wrote the article on, they had played the Denver Broncos in Denver and had eight turnovers, including four Dave Craig interceptions, and still had a chance to win. They lost by 11 points, but they were still there at the end. And in fact, the greatest quote I've ever heard about a game or a loss was given by Dave Craig at the conclusion of that game. We slit our own throats, he said. And that's better. That's a better quote than you know. Uh, we just we just didn't do things right. We didn't execute. We gave the game away. No, we slit our own throats. And so. Coming into this game, it looks tumultuous for Dave Craig again. It looks like he's about ready to lose the job. And against Kansas City, that's a wide open passing offense. Uh, 38 throws per game, which leads the league coming in. Seattle's got to keep pace offensively. Because the defense is trying to learn the 3-4. And they're not looking too solid. Uh, so it's it's kind of, they're kind of streaky, inconsistent, untrustworthy is almost what I would call them. So going into the Kansas City game, if you want to make the playoffs, you're 6-6. Six and six, You have to win this game. You have to win this game to stay in it in the tough division of the AFC West. And you have to win it uh, in order to... Um, you know, get off the schneid of the 500 season. If you're going to challenge that, you got to win here, and you got to win this tough contest against the wide-open passing offense of John Makovic's Kansas City Chiefs. So, guys, if you'll head over and read the article, uh, if you're already here and you're hearing this audio in companion with the article, you can go ahead and read that now. Uh, this... Uh, We'll conclude my commentary on, on the season, and uh, if you have any additions and you were there during that season and you want to add any contributions, please head over, read the article, and post a comment, or even uh, comment on YouTube. I would uh, sure welcome that. Thanks a lot.